Hey everyone, my name is Ned, and today I'd like to continue from where the last evolution guide left off. This time, I'll be covering the sweltering, unforgiving desert arc known as Scorched Earth. This happens to be one of the least explored maps in the game, mainly because of its unfriendliness towards newer players, frustrating weather micromanaging, and being generally looked down upon by the arc community. In spite of these things, Scorched offers well-designed terrain, a fantastic atmosphere, challenging enemies to fight and conquer, and tons of new tools to aid in your survival. First and foremost, let's talk about the biomes. Scorched Earth features 7 or 8 of what you could consider separate biomes, but generally it has about 5 distinguishable ones. These include the canyons, high deserts, mountains, oases, and the dunes. First, let's discuss the canyons. This biome is generally split into two parts, one being far more prevalent than the other. The canyons include the areas that have cliffs surrounding them and usually have pools of water, as well as the narrow crevices, or slot canyons, which split through a small portion of the map and include a cave entrance. Much like every biome in Scorched, the above ground areas are usually hot and hostile, with all kinds of predators such as direwolves, terror birds, and caprasuchus. Despite how dangerous it can be, it's also the biome with the most amount of water, making it a balance of convenience versus danger. Next, we have the high desert. This is the biome that serves as the area in between the canyons and the mountains. It has the highest density of trees, and acts as pretty much the closest thing to a forest that you can find on the map. Unlike most other maps, Scorched Earth has a lot of the same creatures in every biome, scattered around seemingly at random. Because of this, you'll find a lot of the same stuff in the high deserts as you would in the canyons, mountains, and so on. It usually isn't recommended for lower level survivors, but because Scorched has limited trees, the biome itself can be pretty rewarding. This brings us to the mountain biome. Unlike the island, Scorched Earth has mountains which stretch across the entire west side of the map, and has some which also exist in other parts of the map by themselves. The mountains are the go-to place for metal, crystal, obsidian, and the DLC resources Scorched adds which will be discussed later in the video. The mountain biome is one of the deadliest because it incorporates sabers, carnos, rexes, and even uteranus. If that wasn't bad enough, you'll need to look out for what rocks you go near, because the map also adds a new, primarily mountain-dwelling creature known as the Rock Elemental, which disguises itself in the rock form, waiting for its next prey to ambush. Now, to move away from the expectedly dangerous territories, let's talk about the oasis. This biome shows itself in only a few different areas. These include being below the red, green, and blue obelisks, as well as being out in the dunes. The oases below the obelisks are sort of misleading, because survivors might find them and think that they've hit the jackpot, completely oblivious to the dangers within. At first glance, there's tons of water, beautiful plants, and a terminal to transfer in and out of, but usually after discovering this, survivors are quickly bitten and dragged into the murky waters by caprasuchus, raptors, or terror birds. The lesson to be learnt on Scorched Earth is that nowhere is safe, other than the places that you have cleared out and crafted a settlement on. This land, no matter how safe it might look, is a no man's land, up until the point when you make it your own through building and progression. The oases below the obelisks are often popular spots for early and late game, from the easy access to water, transferring, and the convenience of having such a big landmark, but you do have to keep in mind that they are definitely hot spots for player activity. The last biome I'll be covering is the dunes. This is probably my favorite biome in the map, mostly because it feels the least frustrating. It's just you, the beautifully smooth sand, and a whole lot of hostile stuff, albeit spread pretty far apart, so it doesn't feel too overwhelming. Aside from the rolling hills, it's where you can also find the other kinds of oases mentioned earlier. These usually provide tons of plants, a couple trees, sometimes water veins, and other scorched earth resources like salt to mine. The dunes are vast, and basically act as where the ocean would be on a map like the island, and so because of that, they also feature the deep sea loot crates which are even more plentiful on Scorched Earth. As for our creatures, the dunes are where a lot of the larger bugs exist, such as scorpions, titanomyrnas, and new ones like the jug bugs and mantis. On the surface, the dunes do not appear all that dangerous, but that could not be farther from the truth. The real danger can be found under the sand. The Scorched Earth arc was designed with the intention of having lookouts to make sure survivors didn't venture out too far into the desert and find the border. These lookouts are known as deathworms, which will be covered later on. Hopefully this has given you a good breakdown of the different kinds of environments that make up Scorched Earth. With that being said, now let's talk about the harsh weather events that can take place within those environments. These are unique to Scorched Earth, later being added to one of the non-story maps, and show themselves in different ways. First up is the Sandstorm. This is a weather pattern which drastically reduces visibility and constantly drains stamina, making you thirsty and slow. One of the worst things about it is that it severely impairs flyers to the point where they're basically unable to go anywhere. The best way to deal with the sandstorm event is to hide away in a tent or any other kind of structure until it subsides. Similar to the sandstorm, superheat is also best dealt with by taking cover. 
As you can probably assume, superheat is just an extreme version of a normal island heat wave, draining water much faster than normal and inducing heat stroke rapidly. Unlike the sandstorms, you don't want to hide inside any structures other than adobe or tents, since thatch, wood, stone, metal, and even tech basically turn into ovens the hotter that it is outside. The last weather event is known as the electrical storm. This one, at least compared to the others, is the easiest to deal with, but has some restrictive side effects. It disables any electrical structures unless they're covered with tile sets, and it doesn't allow players to use their cryopods, any electrical tools, or even tech weaponry. Now, with the weather covered, I'd like to go in-depth into the desert's prized and profitable resources. There are quite a lot more than the island, and they include cactus, crystal, metal, obsidian, oil and water veins, silica pearls, salt, and sulfur. In order to save time, I'll be briefly talking about where they're found with the full resource map linked in the description. Now, cactus is found in two different types, either in its tall tree-like form, which has to be attacked in order to be collected and actually increases your water when you hit it, or in the berry bush form, which can be collected like any typical bush. Cacti are generally found all over the central and eastern areas of the map. Next is crystal. This all-familiar resource is found on mostly all mountains, especially common along the far-spanning western mountains. Metal is found on pretty much all mountains and can even be found in a lot of the canyon areas as well, kind of by the water. Because of that, it's actually kind of more common to find than on the island. Similar to crystal, obsidian is also found on most mountains, but in much higher quantities along the western parts. Now let's talk about the veins. These include oil and water veins, and act as small nodes which can be taken advantage of with the use of oil pumps and water wells. Oil veins are exclusively found in the eastern part of the map, near the side that Grun Obelisk towers over, and then water veins are commonly found in the central canyon areas, but can actually be found all across the map, spanning into even the dune oases. Moving on to silica pearls. These are found in huge amounts along the canyon rivers, which cut north and south through the middle of the map. Because these pearls are oftentimes in smaller puddles, you can collect tons of them with ease. The second to last resource I'll be covering is raw salt. Like the cactus, this is a new resource Scorch Earth adds, which is used in crafting preserving salt. It can be found all over the map, but mostly in the east and kind of near the oil veins as well as out in the dunes. Last on our list is the more valuable resource known as sulfur. It has utility in crafting the flamethrower and its ammo and being the food for a certain blazing creature. It can be mined exclusively in the mountains and collected from the corpses of wyverns and rock elementals. As I mentioned before, if you'd like to find out exactly where to find any of these resources, I'll have the full map linked down below. Now, with resources out of the way, let's talk about the exciting creatures which are responsible for truly bringing this map to life. Scorched Earth introduces 12 new unique ones, as well as 5 different variations. Starting at the smaller end, the Jerboa is Scorched Earth's version of a dodo, except this time around they can sit on your shoulder and can warn you about what weather events are about to happen. Similar to Jerboa, vultures are also a shoulder pet. They're highly territorial over corpses and pretty much act as dimorphodons, completely destroying your armor on or off mount if provoked. The next pair of creatures you'll find in Scorched are the Jugbugs. You can find these all over the place, and there's a variant which contains an oil sack and one with water. These bugs can really save your life sometimes, but killing them can be a challenge, at least early on, because of just how fast they'll fly away. The Predacious Mantis is the other new bug Scorched adds, and it is a true force to be reckoned with early to mid-game. They're mostly found in the dunes and cave ruins, and will throw themselves at their target, ready to mutilate anything that gets in their way. On a side note, if you tame them, you can actually equip them with picks and other melee weapons to make them into true desert warriors. Next is the Carefree Morella Taps. These things are, as mentioned, pretty relaxed. They carry water in their bodies somewhere and have an interesting behavior when attacked. If they're alone, they'll flee as fast as their lumbering bodies will let them, but if there are at least two or more, they'll gang up on the attacker and totally stomp them down. It's best to be cautious early game when hunting them, just to confirm whether or not they're really by themselves. On the opposite end of the behavioral spectrum, thorny dragons are irritable, beaver-like creatures which have about the same aggro range as a Therizino, meaning about 12 feet. You need to be careful around them because even though they aren't that fast, they have a ranged tail needle attack which inflicts torpor and decreases stamina. Generally these things aren't that great tame, but they do stand as Scorched Earth's main wood gatherer. When it comes to skittish things, the Lymantria probably take the cake. They're usually in the air, and when they're not, they're hanging out on the ground just waiting for something to attack them. The moment this happens, Lymantria will spray out a poisonous gas, harming visibility and destroying the attacker's stamina, which makes for a great opening to escape. Because Lymantria can't attack, they have hardly any use, other than for flying survivors from point A to point B. Now onto the really dangerous stuff. 
The creature Scorched Earth is perhaps most known for is the Wyvern. There are a total of three variants of Wyverns on Scorched, which include the Fire, Lightning, and Poison. The Lightning Wyverns are best for high damage up front, Fire Wyverns being the best for percentage based damage over time. Poison Wyverns on the other hand can do damage to survivors even if they're riding a mount, making them pretty useful in PvP in some cases. Oh, and there's also an Alpha variant of the Wyverns, which is known as the Alpha Fire Wyvern. Because a Wyvern's breath can't do any damage to others of the same kind, it's best to kill these with Fire Wyverns. Next, we've got the Rock Creatures. There are two variants of these, one being the more common Rock Elemental, which is found all over the map but primarily on the mountains, and the other being the Rubble Golem. Both creatures prefer to stay in rock form and will quickly rupture out if they sense a player nearby. They both have a ranged rock attack, which can be very deadly for survivors if they're hit by it. Nearing the end of our list, we have the horrifying doom dwelling beast known as the Death Worm. These are pretty rare on their own, and if you've ever played a game with burrowing worms, you generally know how this goes. These things will make some noise and kick up dust particles in the sand before launching themselves out, but it happens pretty fast. They can do a lot of damage, and on top of that, there's an Alpha variant, which does even more damage and of course has more health. You'll definitely want some serious firepower and strong creatures to take these things out. Additionally, killing Deathworms is actually the only way to get Black Pearls on Scorched, and it usually rewards a pretty tiny amount. Because of this, Scorched Earth is one of the hardest maps for gathering Black Pearls. Last on our list is the strikingly rare Firebird known as the Phoenix. From personal experience, I can say this is one of the hardest tames in the entire game because of how impossibly hard it is to find. They only appear during heat waves, which means you only have a very small window of time to actually tame them. Once the heat wave is over, they turn into a pile of ashes, and as a result of this, you have to tame them over a series of heat waves, making it one of the more time consuming tames. Now that I've talked about the new creatures that Scorched Earth adds, I want to also briefly go over some of the new items and engrams that it introduces. With buildings, it offers a full new structure tile set called Adobe, which is in between wood and stone as far as durability and protection goes. It's also the only structure to insulate you properly from the Toridity. Along with this, there are tons of other new structures like tents, oil pumps, water wells, and wind turbines. When it comes to weapons, Scorch adds the whip, boomerang, chainsaw, flame arrows, flamethrower, oil jars, a new type of grenade, and even a homing missile. Lastly, Scorched adds a new armor set called the Desert Cloth Armor. It's on about the same level as Gilly, and aside from the armor itself giving you tons of hyperthermal insulation, the goggles also protect you from the sandstorms, which can be really helpful. These weapons and armor can be pretty sweet, but what's even better is when they're higher quality. This is where the loot drops come in. As far as supply crates go, they actually tend to be better than the ones found on the island overall, and usually have stuff that is more relevant to the situation you might be in, depending on the level of the drop. Rather than a green drop having some basic resources, like on the island, a green drop on Scorched might have a bow with 30 flame arrows, um, and maybe some desert armor and parachutes. This is just one example, but it usually applies to all the tiers. Similar to the island and other maps, there are two kinds of loot crates. These include the normal ones, which are only found in caves, and the deep sea crates. You might be a bit confused by this since Scorched is a desert and clearly has no ocean, but these are found more or less in place of where they would normally be found on the island, which is in the area that surrounds the entire map. On Scorched Earth, this is the Dunes Biome. Unlike the ones on the island, there are twice as many of these on Scorched at a time, meaning you can find a total of four in the dunes before having to wait a while for the new ones to respawn. These have never had concrete respawn timers, so it's best to wait about maybe an hour or two before expecting to find all four. Just like the last video, I'll leave a full map linked in the description for the spots where you can find each of these deep desert crates, since they're usually really, really profitable. To briefly move away from perhaps more exciting things, I'd like to talk about Explorer Notes. Just like the island, Scorched has notes from four authors, with the additional 4X and HLNA notes. These authors include the previously noted Helena Walker, Sir Edmund Rockwell, and the new ones being Raya and John Dakea. Helena and Rockwell continue from where they left off on the island, while intertwining their ways into Raya and Dakea's storylines. Like I mentioned before, Scorched has the one who waits 4X notes, and more discoveries featuring robot HLNA blabbering on about how interesting humanity became. Despite how many reject Scorched Earth, it can't be ignored that there are tons of notes here that can only be retrieved from this map, making it worth exploring, at least for those interested in the lore. Now, the second to last subject I'll be covering in this video is the caves. Luckily, Scorched Earth only has three in total, compared to the extensive 11 found on the island. 
These caves are all what you'd expect to find in a desert, with having mummified tombs, sacred wall carvings, and even an underground city. Within the caves, you'll find some of the toughest, small to medium-sized aggressive creatures, along with the different tiers of loot crates and, of course, the artifacts. The artifact of the Gatekeeper is found in the old tunnels, the artifact of the Crag is held in the Grave of Tyrants, and the artifact of the Destroyer can be found in the Ruins of Nasty. These caves are pretty similar when it comes to difficulty, but are each unique in appearance and offer a really awesome challenge for those on foot. The last thing I'd like to cover is the map's one and only Guardian. This is known as the Manticore. It's a large creature with the body and head of a lion, but with what looks like wings from a bat and a tail from a scorpion, which can inflict sizable upfront and torpor damage. The Manticore has its own arena, which kind of differs from the others, with the minions being more like mini-bosses in their own rights. In the main lower part of the arena, it has deathworms, which lurk in the sand, waiting for something to eat, and rock golems, which will start to appear after the fight's begun. The usual strategy survivors use to defeat the Manticore involves taking an army of Rexes and surrounding it when it lands. Most other methods are pretty tough, at least on the default setting, because of the reduced damage the boss takes from bullets. Upon defeating the Manticore, survivors can unlock a couple of the tech grams that the island bosses give, along with the tech shield. It also drops some unique Manticore armor skins, depending on the difficulty. Element reward for the Manticore is as follows. Gamma 25, Beta 90, and Alpha 190. Once survivors defeat the Manticore, that's more or less the end game for the whole map. Sadly, there is no ascension or end cutscene that can be unlocked. Scorched Earth was kind of released at a weird time with it being Ark's first ever paid DLC, and some of the gameplay mechanics are honestly just a bit behind, at least compared to the maps that preceded it. In spite of this, Scorched Earth is a fantastically built map with otherwise different and refreshing creatures, items, and notes. I'd like to thank you so much for watching the video. If you happen to learn anything, or just like the style through which I make these, I would super appreciate if you left a like and subscribe to my channel. Stay tuned for my next evolution guide, where I'll be going over everything you'll want to know about the broken and treacherous overgrown arc known as Aberration. Again, thank you so much for watching, keep well, and I'll talk to you later. Bye everyone!